Hello everyone, welcome to the Beagle Cast, Season 2, Episode 3. Today we have Sergio Prado to talk about Embedded Linux Everything, GDB. Sergio, welcome. Thank you guys for, for inviting me for this Beagle Cast. So my name is Sergio, I live in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I've been working with Embedded Development for 25 plus years now. I have my company for the last, I don't know, 12, 13 years. What I do consulting and, and training on several different embedded Linux topics. I also a blogger, so I have a blog where I write stuff about embedded Linux and security. Serverprado.blog. I have a YouTube channel. This year I started doing some videos on embedded Linux development, mainly focused on security, debugging stuff. Those are the two topics that I enjoy to talk about and i'm also kind of a fan of the beagle board project and all of the beagle bones so i have here uh, six that those that i was able to find because i might have more inside my closet there uh, i start with this one the first one the one original beagle, beagle board, board. Yeah. original beagle board i was hired by a company to port android 2.1 to this board at that time yeah hope you have some fun in this video cast i like the, that one was uh, beagle play in the two, background two, that one was 2008 right oh yeah i see the box of the beagle play there you go on the shelf yeah. there are a few boards there what generation nokia was that it was the single core omap 35 30 34 30 so well it, it had dsp in it right so it also was uh, i think a c6 dsp plus a Plus the, plus the ARM Cortex A8. And I have an interesting story about you, Jason. I'm not sure if you, record, if you remember that. Uh, can I share my screen? Oh, yes. Oh, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, let me share this one. Yeah, it was the Droid Sorry. One. Can you guys uh, see it? Do you remember, Jason? <laughs> yeah, I remember. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah that, this, uh, that show doesn't really no. exist anymore, right? So yeah, in Bad Systems Conference. Conference. Exactly. That was a good one. Yeah, and uh, at that time, like we talked a lot, and uh, I, I I told you that uh, I was doing training uh, on a better Linux, and then you just asked it for my address, and you just send me twenty big old bone don't, white, I guess. <laughs> don't tell everybody that I'll I'll give them free boards, <laughs> right? So you know they gotta they gotta go to DigiKey and buy them, or, or you know one of the other. Yeah, sorry about that. But I used that a lot in my training, and then after a few years, I decided to just donate to people that wanted to do some projects with them. So yeah, I, I made a good use of those words. Uh, I, I appreciate everything that you've you've done in the, the, the Beagle community, right? I think you really kind of represent the spirit of what we're trying to do, which is to, you know, to teach others and really enable them to kind of go all the way to to, to making to making products, right? And and understand, you know, you like as you're doing right now with talking about security and debugging, right? Those are like like super critical and important topic. So uh, 20 Beagle Bones was a, a, a very good price for uh, <laughs> bringing you into the uh, into the community. So so thank you for sticking around and, and kind of believing in the mission. Yeah, I mean, it was a pleasure. I really enjoyed this kind of work, you know. I really feel that uh, we need more people that work on the infrastructure to build the product, you know. Uh, we have lots of developers that build the product, like develop applications, but not that many people working on that uh, more low level stuff and, and create this infrastructure so you can like innovate on top of it. So this is really like something that I like to do and like to teach uh, in my blogging, in my videos, in my training. Well, hopefully we're doing just that, right? We're working with you and all the other people in the community to kind of build infrastructure that helps people go and, and, and create new things. So I'm, I'm super interested in, in like what you're, what you've been blogging about recently around, you know, Beagle Play and yeah, just, just what, what type of things are you, you, you teaching people about lately? Yeah. So as I mentioned lately, like I have two talks that I, I really like um, studying a lot and, 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 and trying to educate and teach people need that uh, debugging and security. So if you go to my blog, serverprod.blog, you're going to see like several posts on debugging, how to debug the Linux kernel with GDB. So this one is a recent one. I use it, Beagle Play, that blog post. I have several posts on security, like uh, teaching people about encryption, trusted execution environment, building secure software, 
using sanitizers, all that stuff. Yeah, I really feel that so much things to learn, right? And we usually get stuck in our day-to-day -day work that in the end we don't have time to to learn a little bit. So for me, like writing and, and, and doing videos really helps me not only like to share what I know, but also to learn more about a topic. Sometimes when I want to, to, to write about something, I usually select topics that I want to learn more about it. Because when you are writing, it's hard to write. Um, at least for me, it's hard because you really need to know what you're writing and and for that you have to research and try to understand because if you want to educate people, you don't want to write something that is wrong. So I do lot, like usually on one of my blog posts, it took for sometimes a month to write uh, a blog post that you're going to take 10 minutes to read because it's a lot of research behind it. and. Yeah, I really enjoy because I learn a lot, but it, I, at the same time, it's it's a lot of work. But I mean, in the end, I really like because, as I mentioned, it's a way to learn, it's a way to educate people, and also it's part of my business. That's how like mm -hmm. I get consulting services, for example, building trust with customers. Yeah, and that, that 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 kind of points to a lot of responsibility that you give us, right? Because you know, we need to try to make sure that you can. You, know, you put all that work into making sure that blog post is right. We want to make sure that people can actually get those boards and reproduce them, right? So having having all the the detailed, you know, design materials out there, but making sure that you can get them, you know, ten years down the road from now, and people can still reproduce your your work, right? Is is kind of absolutely critical for us, right? That mm -hmm. that becomes kind of our daily heartaches right in terms of like how we how we approach things right because we want to make sure that that stuff lives i have an anecdote from I, i've only been to brazil once and i think it it was it was a while back probably over over 11 years ago, like 10 11 years ago and you know maybe the statute of limitations has run out for me to say this right but i visited a a, a company building automated teller machines with these guys oh. So they were actually putting Beagle Blacks into into teller machines. What would if 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 you wanted to do something like that? What are some of the things that you would or, or somebody somebody came to you and said I wanted to do something like that? What what are the sort of things that you would tell them um, that they should think about before they uh, you know just start putting dev boards into you know? Things dispensing money. Yeah, that, that's a good question. You know, here in Brazil, because harder expense, we doing harder is expensive, especially here here in Brazil. Lots of projects are done using development boards, and that's kind of common. Usually, I I try like it's all it's always about trade offs. So you have to understand what are the trade offs in this decision, right? Usually, you have to you have three main options, right? You can build the harder from scratch. So you just have the op, like the, the the flexibility to select everything, SOC, RAM, and everything. It's going to be a lot of work, lot, lots of engineering there, like months and months of engineering to make that happen from the hardware to the BSP and software and everything. But that's one option, right? Especially if you have a big engineering team, if you you want to scale your project, you're going to sell, I don't know, thousands of units it might make sense to build everything from scratch on the other like side you have development boards that's kind of the opposite right so the hardware is ready the bsp is ready almost everything is ready you can just use it like put in a box and, and use it but of course there are trade-offs right so you will depend on like that uh, who is going to provide you that board so i had several like uh, Several companies come to me because they decided at best to use those very cheap Chinese boards, you know, and uh, like they change a lot those boards that don't guarantee anything to you. Like in one year, you don't, you cannot see that board anymore, and don't, you cannot like buy that board anymore. And then it's a risk. If you want to assume that risk, that's fine, but you have to know that you have this risk, right? That is also that situation because. If you are building a product that you want to use in like in a critical environment, 
like that specific development board might not be good for you. Maybe it will not support that kind of use case, like high temperatures, high pressure, I don't know. So that could be another challenge if you are using development boards. Um, so again, I think it's all about trade-offs. I don't think it, that is a right or wrong here. It's all about trade-offs. It's a matter of understanding what are the trade-offs between these. What, yeah. what, well, what about security, right? So like what, what sort of things, you know, um, I know Robert and I have been thinking a lot about like how to provide more out of box, you know, kind of default secure uh, solutions, right? You know, it, we've always kind of like, we, we've always punted it down the road a little bit for the users, right? We, you kind of, we know some of the steps involved, but yeah. like, you know, we don't generally execute them because we want it to be really easy for people to get started developing with the, the boards and not having to jump through a bunch of hurdles, you know, but people are doing things like going straight to building products, right? And putting things on the internet and right. So, so we're having to kind of lock a few things down to try to keep people from hurting themselves. And what sort of things would you teach people about, about security? Yeah. I mean, again, another harder, hard question because more trade-offs, right? You increase security, you make it harder for people to use. So usability will decrease, debugability and everything in the middle. So it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to find a middle ground with a good amount of security at the same time you have the flexibility to develop on top of it, right? So for example, I'm, I'm, I am working now with a company called Toradex. They develop system modules and they have a module that they use is AM62. And I help them to implement, yeah, secure boots on it. Uh, we are probably the first company that has this out of the box now. Not sure if I know anything else that provides a, an open source solution. Like you can just build a Toradex BSP right now with secure boots built in. Yeah, I believe Horizon's um, one of the first, right? Yeah. And so I'm working with them on this. And But I mean, it's not like... A, the, the, full, the full BSP build for, for Tradex users because not everyone will want a secure boot solution. Because I mean, if you if you build a BSP with secure boot, you cannot change anything without signing this stuff. So you're gonna impact the usability of the, the system. So it, it's, it's a hard problem from this aspect to provide defaults for debugging. But of course, there are some defaults that you can you can try to provide, like for example, building the system with some flags that provide some kind of a hardening in terms of a process execution, right? So for example, the, the reference distribution from Yoctu does this by default and that's, that's good. Of course, that will impact the bugability because if you try to debug something, you're gonna have problems and you have to disable those flags. So you have to know about this, but uh, for most of use cases, maybe that will not be a problem. Where would you start learning about these flags and some of these the features, right? How would you how would you start kind of getting introduced and, and kind of going down the path of understanding how to go and build a secure system? Yeah, I mean, it's a kind of combination of things. The first thing is that you need this kind of attitude to security. Uh, you, you need to start with an attitude, thinking about what is the product that, that you are building? What is the value that you have inside the, the product? Uh, what are the assets that you have there that you think it's important to protect what, and what you need to do to protect it? So, and this kind of thing that you need to start from scratch, right? Uh, if you already have a product in the field, it's harder to think about this or to solve this kind of uh, of problems. So uh, this is something that we usually as embedded developers don't learn about it. Like they don't teach us security in school, right? Uh, that's mm -hmm. something that you learn in like in, in Pratt, like working on projects. Our boss just asked for any security, whatever that means. So this kind of attitude towards security, I think it's, it's very important for every developer nowadays. You always have to think about security like you you are writing a C application, think about security of that C application. You're writing a communication protocol, thinking about the security of that. So you have to build this kind of basic knowledge on security. You might do that reading books, I don't know, or watching classes on YouTube, I don't know. Of course, on top of that, you have the implementation part, right? And security is like a, an onion with several layers. 
Then you have to think about all of the layers. The more layers, the better, right? It's like a castle with different protections. So if you add a river, then it's going to be harder for people to get into your castle and so on. So security is the same thing, right? That there is no, no silver bullet for security. That there is no, like, that is no such thing as a 100% secure system. And it's always about, security is about risk management. And again, getting back to that concept of onion. So, for example, you have uh, several layers. You might have several layers of security, right? You might want to protect your applications from exploitation. For example, not running them as root. That's a good approach. You might want to use a security module like SC Linux uh, to improve the management of and the usage of resources in terms of security. You might want to implement cryptography if you want to protect assets. You might want to have secure boot for authenticity. I mean, and again, it's hard for embedded people because there is no like central place that you go, wow, now I want to learn security. And then I have a few talks about it if you search for it. I have a few talks on, on embedded Linux security. Uh, where I give an overview of all, all of these, but I mean, for each and every topic, you might write a book about it. Yeah. I, I have um, a, a, a really practical one, right? You know, the, the Beagle Play, we actually released with, with, with just the, the, the GP, right? So it's not, it's not, a, it's not mm -hmm. secured, right? So our, our first AM62 board, where we do plan on releasing the high security, right? This, is, Robert, I know you look worried. This one's not a secret project, right? We're, we're, this is uh, this one's not this one's not a secret project, right? So we're doing a, a second pocket beagle, and we're going to use the uh, the HS device for that, right? To try to give, uh, but but like you know what you know. So some 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 thought on security that I've I've heard, right? It's a very 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 active and thinking about the physical location of the private key used to sign uh, the images that this this can boot right and 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 thinking about where physically those bits live right you know yeah you know which which hard drives which copies on what hard drives right because the the, the, yeah, the physical you should really use a harder secure module for that like you should not store your private keys in hard drives or hard disks, disks where everyone or someone could see it, right? So you will need to, yeah, like, yeah, exactly, <laughs> like this one. So yeah, you're going to generate secure. your keys inside the hard secure module and maybe use OpenSSL and change. For example, we are talking about TI SOC, so you will need to change the TI script to sign it using this hard secure module instead of, yeah. That would be preferable, right? Uh, right, but I mean, you still need. There's, there's still your your own keys in order to access the HSM, right? So, so if you're using that to sign it, right? So you have a, but you are, but you, but now you do have a physical asset, right? That's the critical part, right? right? Is like, and you're you're wondering about where that physically lives because that that thing, and I think you know, for for a lot of us in living in the software world, right, we don't generally think about that as a. a, a, a it, it, it kind of shifts the paradigm a little bit when you think of that like a physical asset holding those bits, you know, versus just like throwing. Sorry, I'm not sure if it's clouds. just me, but the connection is. Is it bad? I think we should be okay. It might just be on your end, Sergio. Yeah, probably. Can you repeat the question, Jason? Because it was like cutting a lot. Yeah, I was really trying to work out what the question really is, right? But I, I know for, I don't know, is that a good way to, th maybe that's what I mean. Is that a good way to think about your kind of, your root of trust mm -hmm. is ultimately living in some physical location? Is that is that an important way to think about security? I mean, you can duplicate that if you want, if you want to think about some kind of like, if I lost this key, like for example, in in in, in the TI implementation, you you have two keys, right? You have the main key, and the backup key. So if for some reason the, the 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 main key is compromised, then you can just switch to the backup key. So you have you always have some kind of options, right? Like let's say your main key is compromised for some reason, or you lost your key, and then you have to rotate to another key, then you can have a backup right. key. But but I think I mean the fundamental point of this, right, is to make sure that 
a limited set of people have the ability to determine yeah. what code is running on that platform, right? Right. So, and ultimately, like we want to transfer that ability to to end users, right? Where they have the exclusive right to determine what surf software runs on this hardware, right? That's uh, right. And I think that you know one of the things we haven't mentioned is that that ability to, to kind of program the fuses in the the, the, the TI. That TI right? makes it very hard. To do it, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. I mean, to 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 fuse like I, I've been working with MXP a, like for a long time, and on MXP SOCs, it's kind of easy. You can just use U boot to fuse the SOCs. Uh, now with TI, you have to 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 craft a small like very meta application. That like for for the for the context for those that don't know like the, the SOC that we have on the Beagle Play you have like an asymmetric multi-core processing inside of it you have not sure if it's one or two M4s an R5 and an A53 I guess quad yeah quad A53 yeah, yeah. quad A53 and to fuse the SOC what you have to do is to craft a small R5 application. Like you actually have to build a boot container with an R5 application and another N4 application that's a blob provided by an XP, sign it with their key that you just have access to the binary. So you create this kind of you boot said container. Not for the TI one though, right? Sorry. Yeah, I'm talking about TI. So you have to build this boot container with this R5 application and inside of it, you would need some logic. Uh, you have to turn it on one pin, call it VPP when you want to write to the fuses. So it's kind of, you build this boot container, it's a, it's a certificate with the, the, the binaries plus the, the, uh, public, the, the, the public keys that you want to flash the fuses for checking the signatures. And uh, yeah, it's kind of different. Uh, it was a different experience for me because working with IMX, it was kind of easy because I could do everything with U-Boot without the need of an external application. But for certainly it's more secure uh, on, on the TI implementation because of this. Yeah, the reason you, you need it. the two binaries is you have the R5 actually bootstrapping the system and then the M4 is what is actually... Yeah, you, really you, you have... An, exactly. And you have like the two cores communicating between themselves, like the R5 send messages to M4. And this is a firmware that the TI provides that is signed by TI, so you cannot run anything else here. And this firmware will write to the fuses. So it's not you that's write to the fuses. You just send messages. Like I want to write this, and then this firmware will do it for you. And then the, the so, firmware on the M4 does the writing. Exactly. So yeah, it was a nice experience making that. <laughs> and I, I had a, a kind of I made a mistake because I have to, I, I have to here just one module, and I made a mistake. I I write to the fuses before updating the application. Create a brick. And then yeah, no, yeah, it was a brick for a few hours, but then I was able to craft like. Uh, I was able to over to boot over USB using DFU, uh, my signed bootloader. And then I made my bootloader to boot the kernel over TFTP, a signed kernel, because I was using a FIT image, a signed FIT image. And then I mounted an NFS uh, root file. C I mean, I was able to, yeah, build a Frankenstein distribution with the signed images to write my signed. Uh, distribution. Uh, it took me a few hours to make that work, but uh, fortunately, yeah, it was not a break. My knowledge. Well, maybe we can do some things together to try to simplify the tooling and the documentation on the process, right? To make the it documentation, easier, right? yeah, yeah, it was a, a problem for me. I mean, TI provides lots of documentations, but it's kind of sparse, you know, something here and there. Like, I would like to have something like this is how Secure Boot works. Have you have you seen docs.beagleboard.org now? It's it's kind of a new project. Have you seen it yet? No. Yeah. Uh, there's we we put a lot of work into docs.beagleboard.org over the last year, especially uh, Deep Katri, who is a former uh, Google Summer of Code student or in, or contributor for 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 Beagleboard, and now you know we have you know we continue to to, to work with with Deep Katri on docs.beagleboard.org, and uh, really. You know, people like yourself, right? This is definitely a place where you know I would encourage you to make contributions to nice. kind of help you know kind of define this process. I, I've been working 
you're particularly on some articles around the AM62 boot process, but I have a very, I have a, a I'll just call it a strange allergy to serial connections and, uh, you know, to, to debuggers, especially, I won't even, I mean, it, there are times on everything. So people have a harder time using them. That's my conspiracy theory right there. I, I have the, I have the tag connect cables, right. Sitting around right in, in, in reaching. So I can JTAG. Right. And I have, I have debuggers. I just, I don't think users should have to use them. Right. When you, when you have known working code, it gets you to a point where you can load other things on there and deal with things at a, at a higher level. Right. I think that that's something that we should be providing to end users in a, in a rational way that allows them to get to that that high level usage standpoint very, very quickly. Right. And U-Boot's kind of teetering, right? Yeah. I did a, a presentation some years back on, on, on Pocket Beagle actually doing USB boot of U-Boot and then having a U-Boot net console. Mm -hmm. So I, I could do U-Boot commands over USB entirely. And yeah. uh, so I, I never had to connect the, the serial and I could still interact with, with U-Boot. Mm -hmm. We actually use that in the production of Pocket Beagle, right? So um, we, 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 we boot that and like, that's how we write to the EEPROM and how we do the testing. We actually end up booting everything over, over USB. But you are uh, seeking out of a, like a graphic application user friendly that they can flash images. Well, I mean, that's ultimately something you can, you can do, right? So I'm really happy with the snag boot stuff that's, that's been done mm -hmm. out of the, the bootland guys. Uh, I mm -hmm. think Bootland did Snag Boot, right? And, yeah. and there was work that we did with uh, Belina sometime back on Etcher uh, to try to put hooks into Etcher so that it would bootload and then you could mm -hmm. perform the the, the, the flashing. Uh, that was another, keep plugging uh, Google Summer of Code, that was another Google Summer of Code project uh, to actually to bootload something like that. And and if you look at our new, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention Beagle 5 Fire, right? So we actually, you get to a bootloader and, and you just, do the flashing of the with with etcher there directly from the from the bootloader right so but getting people to that point where it looks like a disk drive and you can flash the onboard flash or just getting to that point over usb where you can put everything in i think is is a you know you talked about having to go to dfu over usb right i think yeah. that's actually a really good point to to kind of from a a documentation standpoint, an approach to mm -hmm. kind of take, right? You could use that ROM bootloader, you know, get those those the to to booting it over for USB and not just rely on serial port connections, right? But I think you yeah, you get to that higher level, those GUI and for you know interfaces and other things really to make it simpler for the users to get started. And uh, yeah, and so if you look become at... extra important, I think you touched on it a bit earlier, Jason, but on the TI side of these, the AM62, all devices going forward are going to be the HSFS silicon, so the high secure uh, field programmable ones. So we're, we're moving away from having GP as an option, just because we figure, you know, you want the security options, you want to start with a pre-signed image, but that adds some complexity, like Serge just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But that documentation yeah. is coming online on the TI side as well. And we start with the publicly available like key, right? So, so there's a there's the TI private key, which is really private, which we never get access to. But then there's like mm -hmm. it, it, there's a certificate for a key. I, I, I'm not sure I understand this perfectly, but that is public that anybody can use to sign an image to boot off of it, right? By default, until you blow the fuses. Yeah, so, that is a default. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way I understand. Okay. And uh, right, so that's super cool, right? But then you want to get to that point where people could easily build their custom assigned images. And uh, yeah, that's... Uh, so yeah, we, that's what totally we have done at Teradex, yeah, what we have done at Teradex, we created a, like, we have a Yocto layer, Meta Teradex security, and you just like inherit a class and define a few variables with the location of your keys and that's it. Um, something that was very nice, like uh, I had a bad experience with an NXP on this because they are not good at doing this, but TI, like they have done a great job and on the on the BSP side, I haven't, I hadn't, like I didn't do anything like on the BSP side, like they are using that new like uh, tool from, from U-Boot being FMT, right? To, to create the boot container, then they, the, the, the implementation for signing the images Fit. is already implemented. Like you're using so, like fit images, you mean like that? Yeah, exactly. So everything like I haven't, 
I didn't need to do anything like the BSP level to sign the images. It was already implemented by TI. That was very nice. Like for MXP, I had to implement lots of chow scripts to do the signing. It was crazy. So what's what's your latest blog post on? What's the latest thing you've did on? I don't think it was necessarily related to security. I think it was more on debugging. The latest blog post that I think I published today it was about oh, a new one. Yeah, uh, random numbers. I was researching a little bit about random numbers and it was fun to do this research and write a little bit about it. Visiting Sergio Prado, the blog. <laughs> yeah, because the, the January 17th one is kind of the one I was thinking about, right? And so yeah, feel free to share random screen numbers, I don't think is... Sorry, Andre? I'm saying feel free to share a screen if you want. Oh, okay. You can look at Sergio's blog. Sure. Or Sergio uh, could share as well if you want. I can share it. Would you like me to share? Uh, I'm already at it, I think. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This one, uh, yeah, I wrote in. Yeah, so January. So this one, right? So, so de debugging the Linux kernel. You're losing uh, audio here, Jason. Yeah. Right, so I think. Yeah. I think you you did a target here with the uh, with Eagle Play, right? Which. Yeah, Jason, you might want to stop uh, sharing your screen. It looks like it's uh, my, it's affecting your audio quality. I love Play, by the way. Uh, uh, Jason, everything yeah. you said there did not come through. So. When you're sharing. All right. Well, I stopped sharing. Maybe you get some uh, some pretty pictures of it, right? But your 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 blog posts on the debugging the Linux kernel with GDB and using Beagle Play, which I love. And so, what? Tell me, tell me what the point of that article is, and what do you explain to people how to do? Yeah. So I have like a, a like a Linux debugging training where I teach people about debugging techniques, and I started by saying like. Adding printings to the code is a debugging technique, but the problem is that it's not just the only one technique available, right? And usually when we start our career, like uh, that's what we do to debug software, but uh, the problem is that we get used to it. And there are some hard problems that uh, if you try to add prints, you're going to take like a lot of time to find out the, the issue. So there are other techniques like tracing, like Adding print to the code is a kind of a tracing technique. Like your print is a trace point that you add to the code, but you have to rebuild your code. I mean, it takes a little bit of time, uh, especially if you are doing that at the kernel level, right? You have to rebuild the kernel, reboot the, the system with a new kernel and so on. Uh, if you want to trace the kernel, you can just use ftrace for that. So that's a technique that you can use. You don't have to rebuild the kernel. It's already there. Just build the kernel with ftrace and then you can trace the kernel whatever you want. There are some hard issues, like sometimes you want to understand the execution of the software. You want to inspect memory at runtime to see what's going on, look at structures. And I mean, can you debug that with prints and the code? You can, but it's going to take a lot of time. Using an interactive debug, debugger tool like GDB, it's a better approach in this specific case. And that's what I teach in this, in this article how to set up a debug infrastructure so you can debug the kernel with GDB. So the kernel has this uh, implementation of the GDB server protocol that they call it KGDB. Uh, so you can compile the kernel with KGDB support and start the kernel in this mode. When you start the kernel in this mode, it will stop the execution and wait for a connection. And then you can use the GDB form from your tool chain to connect to the kernel and debug it step by step. So that's what I teach in the in the article, yeah. Very nice. And you yeah, notice that, uh, so you, you're not specifically using open OCD, right? You're entirely doing serial no. uh, KGDB here, right? But but you could do exactly. some of this over open yeah. OCD as well. Yeah, exactly. And I, I believe that the open OCD hooks are in there for kind of some of the popular JTAG tools, right? So yeah. you can actually Usually, do... yeah. Usually I, I don't recommend uh, open OCD for that because I think it's uh, it's more work in terms of infrastructure. Usually, I recommend Open LCD when you want to debug the bootloader or the early startup of the kernel. As soon as you have the kernel running and you want to debug part of it, and then I think GDB is a better approach. It's it's easier, faster. It's less prone to errors uh, because you have less like you don't have th those all of those levels right so you need gdb that talks to open lcd that would use a driver to talk to a to a jtag adapter and 
talk to the GTAG interface. Yeah. It's yeah. So, so here you're using a remote. Is. So here you're using a remote host and a serial or Ethernet connection to the Beagle Play yeah. to uh, perform the. I, I think it's interesting that you're looking at Ethernet as well. You should look at USB. I think it's fun. <laughs> I know the USB stack is a little complicated relative to some of the other subsystems, right? So you know. I'd love yeah, to for this blog post, I use it serial. Yeah, serial part yep. for the connection. Right, but Ethernet is an option, right? I think, you know, that's, but you have to have a nice stable subsystem that's not yeah. for the communication, right, to, to, to work with, right? UART is like really, really simple. And, and you know, Ethernet is still yeah. pretty reasonable. And it's low as well. Yeah, UART is low. Like you press next and then three seconds, it goes to the next line. I, I think uh, the open OCD one is, so here there's a host. And then there's a separate one. So, so we've had a bunch of people in the community looking at the the kind of the, the microcontroller cores and the DSP cores and connecting those up with OpenOCD within the same board, right? So within the same SOC, right? So you've got you know OpenOCD running, and you know if you were if you booted Linux on it, maybe you could do you know GDB, KGDB on Linux and some of these other small cores. You know, what we're seeing kind of growing in the Beagle community is actually use of Zephyr. In fact, you can even run the whole Beagle Play as like a, a, a great big microcontroller, massive microcontroller with, with Zephyr um, for the whole thing. But you can also just run Zephyr on something like the R5, um, you know, inside of a Beagle Play, right? And then you can use... So you are OCD. saying that I can debug this R5 firmware running open LCD in the device right inside the, the embedded Linux system. Uh, and and then I would like run GDB server together with it. And then I can have- Well, my GDB, GDB server would- So I'm not sure how it works with the with, with the connection to GDB, right? Because like you could easily do the, the, the breakpoints, but like, I don't think you, I think GDB server would be running from open OCD, right? In the sense that like, like you won't run software breakpoints, right? Because you're not running Linux on the target, right? You're not running Linux on the R5, right? So there would have to be a, a, a GDB server um, running on like the A53s, right? So the A53 would run both JDB, yeah, exactly. GDB and the GDB server talking to open OCD to talk to the R5 as yeah. opposed to like, you wouldn't run GDB server on the R5 unless you ran Linux on it. That's very nice. Yeah. Can I do that on a Beagle Play? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna try. And, it, yeah. and and also, I notice we're gonna have to fix this, right? So I'll have to send you another free board. Don't tell anybody. But this is a <laughs> AI64, right? Because this one's just fun. Because instead of having, I don't know how many R5s the Beagle Play has. Is it just one that's programmable? It's, or? it's just one, but it's not programmable. It's the M4 that's programmable. It's the M4 that's programmable. Okay, so you just have the M4 to play with. This one has six programmable R5s. There's like uh, four M4s on here as well, but like usually a couple of them are dedicated to tasks like working with the coprocessors, like the stuff for like the, the video acceleration. And like if you ran the, uh, the Edge AI stack, I know that, that runs on a couple R4s, and I think there might be some coprocessor coordination with one of the M M4s. Yeah, you got the, so you got you got dual A72s, and then you have four R5s in the main domain. You have a C7, and then two C66s, and then you also have an MCU island with another two R5s. So that's six total. But part of that, you know, part of that fun kind is, of focus separate MCU island versus your main processor island. And out of the box, couple of them weren't in lockstep too, so there's fun issues with that. Well, it's is the wake up one probably boots up? Yeah, it's not required. I think the the wake up one might default coming up on on lockstep. I don't know. I don't know which one I'm trying to boot up on lockstep, right? But yeah, having that for for extra safety and stuff is a big part of it. Um, there's also twelve PRU cores. They're not they're not fully symmetric, right? There's a uh, I think there's is it how many subsystems are there? Um, there's the TXRUs and PRUs and. Like, and so they come in, they come in like threes, right? They're actually, they come in sixes, right? So I think there's two IC, ICSSGs, right? I think there's two ICC, ICSSGs in there and each of them has essentially six PRUs, right? So you have a, a each of the, you have a, a pair of subsystems in each I, ICSSG and then, yeah, you've got the ones that are directly controlling the pins and the ones that are kind of maintaining queues and right so you've got the yeah the the yeah it's a lot of peer use 
Yep, two ice and two C zeros. It's <laughs> AMs. And seven? there's also a C seven that can do eight tops. Pardon? What is the SOC? A, a, a TDA, TDA four, four VM. Okay. Yeah, and the you know it's got the the, the reason the AI is in the name is because it's got a C seven plus MMA that you can run like. You, know, you can use TensorFlow Lite and offload it, right? So they, yeah. they provide an OpenVX interface to to load, you know, you have to kind of use firmware on there to, to go and load models for, you know, accelerated inference, right? So you can, it does eight tops and it's got two C6 DSPs and the one C7 with the, the MMA on it, right? Which is the matrix multiply accelerator. It gives it the, the lots of multiplies, lots and lots and lots of multiplies. Eight trillion. Poor and bad that engineers smart things to learn. Yeah, yeah. This one, I, you could just spend a lifetime just exploring this one. <laughs> there's really, um, yeah, I can imagine. There's really a lot. It does have the massive heat sink, but well, like with this, you really don't need any any fan whatsoever, right? Uh, it runs mm -hmm. a lot cooler than the the original BeagleBone AI, mm -hmm. which I did see in your. In your stack, right? So, which I really like the form factor of the BeagleBone AI, right? That, that one didn't kind of come up, but so we've also like done things like um, the Beagle Five Fire, right? That kind of mimics that uh, BeagleBone AI form factor. Sorry, I went on a tangent. Like, like you, know, do you are you getting interested at all in Zephyr? Is that something that uh... I'm exploring, working on a training about Zephyr? Already provided some consultancy to customers, but I would say I'm not an expert on Zephyr yet. Yeah. I was working with like FreeRTOS for since the beginning, I guess. Big fan, but FreeRTOS is just a kind of a small like kernel. 3.c files, yeah. very simple, no drivers, no nothing, no stacks. And yeah. Zephyr is really a game changer in this field. I mean, I really see Zephyr like the yeah, the feature for RTOS is you cannot stop it. It's going to be the new Linux for microcontrollers. And everyone is using it, so yeah. I mean, I like that you can, you know, because you have the you know the selective linking right so it uses you know better or worse right it uses the device tree and you know the k config stuff to here like just filter stuff out from being included in the binaries right so you can make incredibly mm -hmm. small binaries right essentially the equivalent of bare metal right size yeah. size binaries but then you still have a device driver structure right exactly. so your code is is like can really you can have some high level things you got you know full tcp ip stacks and bluetooth stacks and you know you can really have some some rich software but you don't have to compile yeah. it all in right you can you can yeah. really pick and choose what you're going to put into your binaries so it's, it's the new bare metal yeah 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 totally agree um Everything that we learned, like in the Linux project, like the right decisions we decided to use on Zephyr, right? Like, as I mentioned, device trees, like the K build, build system, everything that works only we decided to, like, they decided to use on Zephyr. I think there are other, like, uh, there is a huge community behind it. If you, like, compare with other open source, real time operating systems out there, that is, you cannot compare with Zephyr in terms of the size of the community. And, and I also think that having the Linux foundation behind it, it's a very like uh, important factor because it's not like one company, like one vendor, like uh, it's not Microsoft or uh, not like the Linux foundation, like uh, a company that- For, for Amazon, for your toss. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, they don't take decisions based on like, on, on, like uh, the business value, like of Amazon and Microsoft. and. It's like they are like a kind of agnostic. They just bring a community together with the vendors interested, and yeah. So yeah, yeah. We're hitting the top of the hour. I I, I have a, a question. If if you were to mentor a Google Summer of Code contributor, what would you? What problem would you most want them to tackle for the open source embedded systems development community? What kind of problem? Um, that's a good question. I'm gonna to have to think a little bit about it. And... Oh no, top of your head. Don't have any time. We already reached the top of the hour. So <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I will say the complexities of building a, a Linux system. So like most of my customers, they have this problem. They don't know how to work with Yocto. And they receive a Yocto uh, layer. So they have to spend months learning about it. So this kind of complexity. Like I've been working with OpenAbedded before Yocto, 
So for me, I can create a layer and do stuff like this. But we have more and more developers. Like we have this kind of convergence between stuff, right? People are doing IoT together with Yocto. Like they are like uh, Node.js developers that need to do Yocto stuff. So it's complex. I mean, but, I have to teach. Yeah, I'm gonna just th like I'm gonna th yeah. throw a curveball because they're like I don't know if you've okay. seen like Home Assistant, which I I'm, I've kind of fallen in a little bit in love with Home Assistant because it kind of gives me a Belina like experience. With you know, Belina is built on Yocto, and I love love it. Yeah. But like with with something like Home Assistant, right? They they do a build root, a small build root image, and then they put all the application stuff in a Docker container, which I have I have a hate hate relationship with Docker, but the uh, but the idea of like uh, you know, separating kind of the system runtime elements from the application, like uh, dependency bits, right? Yeah. You know, you know, kind of, kind of helps, right? Yocto doesn't separate them, right? They all get kind of blended in, but it can make something, you know, an isolated application, right? But if you want to yeah. have these rich, complicated applications, right, you can kind of punt that down the road with something like a, a, a Docker exactly. container, you know, exactly. I'll, I'll not say Debian a Docker or... or... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Uh, for example, I, like in the pandemic, I worked with Toradex for two years, like full time as a consultant, because I was not able to do training at that time. And I helped them to build this platform, like call it Horizon, right? And they are basically building that kind of solution, like an open source Linux distribution. Uh, if you want to build it from sources, you can, but you don't need to. You can just install it and run your applications inside containers. So you just care about your applications. So that's one way to go. Not sure. Like nowadays, it's pro possibly like containerized applications are possibly the best solution yeah. for this kind of problem. Like, Node.js Node is just not something I want into my like my base system, right? Do a simple yeah. build root. I mean, sure, I could build Node.js in, in Yocto or build root, but if I just make a, a system capable of running Docker and build root, then I can yeah. put my Node.js stuff all in exactly. Alpine and, and a Docker container. So yeah. why, and why the problem build Node.js? Yeah, and the problem is not that just building, but maintaining over time, right? Because you have a new version of OpenGS. Now you have to update your Linux distribution because of that. So with a container, you don't have to just, yeah, pull a new container. Reproducible so. builds. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, to rise, this is kind of, yeah, like uh, read the only like Linux distribution. You don't change it. You just change using containers. And there are other like kind of solutions like that, like Balena, very similar. So does builder not solve your problem? And you know, are you are you looking at the complexity of rebuilding Node.js yeah. and having a Node.js based application that just works, or are you looking mm -hmm. at how to build a embedded system, you know, execution environment that just works, right? And is it enough just to kind of separate the two? Yeah, I think that solves part of the problem. You still need the Linux distribution. You still need to build it. You still need like an infrastructure that is secure, that is updatable, and that is still not easy to build and maintain over time. So I think we, this is still one of the problems that we have. It's a lot of work to create and maintain a Linux distribution over time, especially now that you have to build, like to build products with a remote update system from like almost every time, like you need it right now. And yeah. so you need to think about how you're gonna do that. And I mean, you're gonna probably do that with Yocto because that's the BSP provided by the vendor and yeah. And with the way things are changing too, it's like you have to also provide security updates to those systems too. And how do you, you know, you built a Yocto image, how do you make sure it always gets security updates too? Yeah. Like so what's your, what's, so what's your favorite, like, field update layer is it is it mender is it rauk is it sw update is it uh, everybody seems to have their own that they're comfortable working with every single embedded consulting company seems to have rolled their own have you rolled your own too did you make Actually, your own yeah. you have your own I don't feel, you i feel times yeah and i mean i've been i have worked with sw update and rauk and mender and, and at toradex we built using a technology called OS3. I'm not sure if you are aware of OS3. So in Horizon, we use it OS3. That's kind of very different. Like almost all of them, like Rauk, SW Update, they are all like an A and B update system, right? With two partitions, you're always running from one partition. 
With OS3, it's kind of different. You have a kind of repo there. And with objects, your root file system is going to be mounted using this uh, repository of objects. It's a very interesting concept. And if you want to update your root file system, you just have to pull new objects from a repo. And this operation is atomic. And you always have deltas, like you're always pulling just the new objects. So you increase a little bit the complexity of the solution, but you have lots of advantages. And that's one of the reasons at that time we decided to use OS3 when we were building Terizon. So yeah, I, I again, I don't like to say what is the best one because I think it depends on your requirements. So my, you have my, to look My question at... started with, it's your contributor. You're, you're a GSOC contributor. So they're going to put okay. together you know, something that, that uh, enables embedded systems development easier. So, you know, why don't you, why don't you write your idea down and, and maybe work with Beagle this summer to try to help make a, a, a definition of something for Beagle play that's really easy to update and maybe we can, you know, leverage it on something like, a, you know, Pocket Beagle 2 that's going to have a high secure device, right? So, and, you know, I, I, I hate that, uh, you know, kind of the answer is like download SD card images and reflash your board. Um, that doesn't work in the field. It doesn't work on, on uh, Robert in the live stream, you didn't show any of your racks, right? So all of your, your crazy continuous integration racks, right? So, it's like, we so don't loading have all those up with something to update images, I think would be like, uh, that's, that should be the mission, right? How do we update Robert's farm so that he's managing all those devices remotely? And they, you know, Sergio mentioned OS tree. Cause I had like, one customer look at that for a while and there are app ports of that. And it'd be kind of cool to see OS tree being used on the Beagle, just push in the field, update it. Instead of updating like a hundred packages, you just basically push the new image over. It, it's very cool. And now, especially with yeah. that little board you're showing has 16 gigs of EMMC on it. The original pocket Beagle, well, you just, oh, only four on it. Never mind. And it, it, it may be on the chopping block too, in order to reach a price target. So I think that people didn't like the, like so far talking to people, they didn't like the four gigabytes, right? So they wanted more. Yeah, it's too small. It's like, it's yeah. So if it's too small, maybe we just take it off and use SD cards. Especially when you're talking Docker and multiple containers, you know, we're not in the days of the original Beagle that Sergey was showing where, what did I have for Ned? And uh, they got x11 running on there for full desktop it was like 128 megs of NAND or something in the region 128 Google. megabytes yeah yeah ran his root no password but desktop was there we've, we've all right way. are we wrapping two. it here andre did you have any any anything we should we should talk about in closing um no not in particular i mean we'll look forward to having sergio on in the future his the link to his blog and everything is going to be in the description down below um, same there. with the podcast right there wherever they're moving it these days right and uh, yeah we're we're looking forward to everything you're doing with horizon we'll be at embedded world soon so always remind for that still call for gsoc still ongoing well we'll note tomorrow whether or not we're a mentoring organization Yep, first so, deadline, but students yeah, we, keep we, on posting. Yeah, we already, we already, we're already students are already showing up and engaging and talking about project ideas. And hopefully, we get chosen to be a mentoring organization, and and you know we can bring on a few students, right? I think we're 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 kind of trying to wrap up the the mentors for the summer as well, right? So make sure we know who in the do you need mentors really going. How to become? We a do mentor. need mentors. That's why I was that's that's I was specifically trying to recruit you on this. Okay. Yeah. And of course, you've been around the community for a long time. I know that you could mentor somebody, so you would be a welcome mentor. That's like a student looking to work on high security devices. You know, Siri could be a great mentor. And you think about, you know, all the shell scripts people have to do. The fact, oh, just go on U-Boot and hit program. That could be a project right there. Good. So Sergio. Yeah. I mean, thanks a lot for, again, for the, 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 the invite. And I think it was fun. And um, hopefully people like the, the, the chat here. Yeah. I mean, let's keep collaborating. I'm really interested in collaborating with you guys in the security side. So if you want to have secure boot, like now that I build this knowledge on secure boot for AM62 uh, for something, I mean, I can help you guys if you want this on your HS devices. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Let's stay in touch. Thanks for tuning into the BeagleCast again. Next episode is going to be March 5th. See y'all.